Hey there, Dave Politis, Canaan Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. Thanks for being here, and uh, we've got some interesting things going on. First of all, in the uh, last several weeks, a lot of comments about uh, an X Files episode. I asked you guys to watch. Well, I've got another one, <clears throat> and if you've been watching my past videos, you, you've been keeping up. So there's one called, uh, X-Files called 4D. And in that, they talk about parallel universes. And it's brought up by talking from one agent to another. Now, theoretical physicists have been talking about this topic for a long time. And if you watch this episode, you'll see how one agent broaches it to another. I've been very fortunate in the last year to have met uh, a couple of federal agents who have been investigators on these type of topics. And I haven't spoke, spoken much about it. And there's going to be a time when they'll come out and they'll be interviewed and they'll talk about this. I already know they're going to. And it essentially vilifies, validates everything I've been talking about. Because when I speak about the agent showing up on these cases and being interested, it's because the cases offer insights into the topics that we've been talking about that parallel the facts I give you. So the people that have been sitting on the sidelines chuckling and grinning and saying nasty things, suck it up, buttercup, because you're going to be eating a lot of, what's a nice word to say, garbage. And it's been going that way for a long time. A lot of people have contacted me in the last six months that have watched our videos. And a lot of them are park rangers, search and rescue, professionals, uh, police officers, firefighters. And they've only validated more about what I've talked about. So I appreciate everyone uh, jumping on board and helping us move forward on this. I, I appreciate it greatly. And at times, this feels very frustrating that we're not moving faster. But the reality of it is, I want everyone to think about this. The UFO phenomena has been around for 50, 60, 70 years. And how much real advancement has been done there? <laughs> as far as understanding where they're from, none. Uh, if you think about all the cryptid to topics, how much advancement has been there been done? Really none. So if you get frustrated because my topic, missing people with this specific criteria isn't moving along faster, well think that the power of the federal government, the amount of resources internationally they have to talk to intelligence people from other countries, to trade secrets, to work together, to pour millions of dollars. <laughs> and look at me, I'm really a nobody with no budget and floundering ahead trying to understand what is inundating us on a topic that eight years ago nobody even ever talked about or even knew existed. So I think we are making progress, baby steps. But what the important part is, is that slowly People are coming out and saying, Dave, you're on the right track. Dave, I'm going to talk to you about this. Dave, I'm going to go on camera in the future. And Dave, this is all going to make sense. Excellent. I'm a bit disappointed, shall we say, that the second season of Skinwalker Ranch doesn't appear as though it's been picked up by the History Channel or Prometheus Entertainment. 
very disappointed. And if Prometheus and the History Channel didn't pick it up, I am very surprised that another production group didn't jump in and, and say, hey, we'll do it. It should be done. Um, I don't know what the uh, dollar demands are by the people running the ranch, but it would seem to me that a reasonable amount of money would probably take it into production. Gosh, gosh knows, I, I get approached all the time by production companies wanting to do something. And like I've stated before, if I don't have some sort of control over the production or some final say in post-production, I'm not going to do it because of a variety of reasons. And we've talked about some specifically. I get talked to a lot about the missing people statistics that you read about on the news. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of people missing in Alaska. No, there's not. There's not. <laughs> it's a fabricated number made to get you aware of the situation. If there were hundreds of thousands of people missing in Alaska, or even tens of thousands, it would decimate the population of Alaska. It's not happening. Now, the way the FBI, and I've said this before, but a lot of you are new, the way the FBI keeps track of missing people statistics. If somebody, say a teenager is in a family and he runs away or she runs away once, and comes back the next day and it's reported to the police, that's one missing person. A runaway is counted as a missing person. That same person runs away 10 times in a year, that's 10 missing person cases. It never says anywhere in public that that case has been resolved. It's just 10 missing person cases. Now, what percentage of the total missing person cases even come close to what we're interested in? it'd be less, less than one half of 1% of the numbers you're reading because the vast, vast majority of the numbers are all resolved. And a lot of them are voluntary disappearances. People that want to fall out of society, people that don't want to talk to relatives, people that just don't want to get away. Nothing against the law about that. They don't even have to talk to the police if they don't want to. But that's... It's a big issue. Um, so the real unusual part are less than one half of 1%. Probably mostly one half of one quarter of 1%. That's how small the numbers are. So when you see a FBI statistic that oh, 400,000 people went missing last year, <laughs> I don't even give that two seconds of my time. And it's a number just to get you to pay attention. So don't worry about it. And specifically, there's a couple shows about missing in Alaska that have tried to make this seem a lot more interesting than it really is. There's a lot of First Nations and Native American people in Alaska that have suffered a lot of criminal issues. And there are people missing from them, their group but the vast, vast majority is there's no mystery. There's just no law enforcement there, and it's criminal. There might be some cases up there that fit into our profile, but it's very hard to get to facts because law enforcement, a lot of them don't even take reports. And they may just fill out a three by five card that a person's missing with no relevant facts about it, what happened. So to get to the point about what's really going on, it's extremely difficult. So anyhow, that's that. Now, some very, very interesting letters. Real quick, that X-Files episode called 4D, Parallel Universes, and it's about an agent who gets shot. It's a very mind-bending episode, and it's, it's before X-Files got stupid and irrelevant. And it's back in the days when they were working on real cases and the X-Files was putting them on. Yeah, the X-Files did have some real federal cases that they worked on and produced. How do I know that? Because I spoke to an agent that was involved in it. There you go. More of that months into the future. 
Okay, our first email. Dave, my wife and I are with you in spirit, and we wish you and your loved ones peace and healing from the loss of Ben, understanding and love. I just wrote a little piece today in regards to the holiday season. I hope you enjoy reading it as an outline or addendum to some of the thoughts you've recently expressed. Regarding Thanksgiving, we must remember that better times in our country, the principles of our country was founded upon and keep separate the corruption and evil of man that has stained our history as a people and that evilness is currently on an exponential rampage. Throughout history, the story of mankind has been one of balance between good and evil. Right now in this era, evil has the upper hand and it is destroying our country and its foundation on every front, politically, strategically, economically, morally, and socially. We're being attacked at every front and the main weapon being used is the blindness of our populace. This gets even better. There are a few questions to ponder. How bad is it going to get? Folks, I worry about this every day. Are we at the foothills of the total control of mankind by a handful of people? Are we as a nation beyond the point of no return from saving our country and the freedoms which are guaranteed by the Constitution? I think these are essential questions to ponder, but a solution to a problem can never be found and implemented unless the problem is correctly identified, that's number one. Number two, the cause of the problem is determined. Number three, correct strategies are implemented to correct the problem. Now in conclusion, is our government actively and accurately defining the cause of the problems and implementing strategies to correct those problems? What do you think? Or is our government incorrectly defining the cause of the problems, thus implementing strategies that actually amplify, exasperate, and add kindling to the problems, thus ushering in chaos? <laughs> As someone who lives around Border Patrol people all the time, I'll tell you what they're saying that under the past administration, this isn't political folks, this is their statement, so don't get all uppity about it. Under the past administration, the borders were under control. Fences were being built and they were on progress of making people stay on the other side of the border while their legal issues about immigration were approved and the people were thoroughly vetted before they were approved to come in the country. As in now, if you're a family, you come across, you're in, you're not thoroughly vetted like they were doing, and we lose control of who is here. This is from the Border Patrol. And if you're not watching the interviews with the Border Patrol people, you're not watching the right channels. To understand truly what's happening and the thoughts, you need to watch the sheriffs that have the jurisdiction along the border and the border patrol people that work there. They are the ones telling the truth about this. They have no reason to lie. So, if your answer to number two, if your answer is number two, then other questions may come to mind as the ensuing chaos in our country unfolds. Is chaos being used to eventually implement change? Number two, what strategies have been employed to achieve chaos? Well, one, I will tell you right out, is abolishing bail and allowing everybody out of jail without bail and without being held, even if it's a serious felony. It's freaking ridiculous. Fact. Look at the number of people that have been murdered and seriously injured by somebody under those conditions. And I'll just refer to the Wisconsin incident at the parade. How far has chaos replaced order and stability in our country? Number four, what solutions will eventually be presented to the people by our government 
as relief from the chaos to restore order and stability. Read that again. What solutions will eventually be presented to the people by our government as release from the chaos to restore order and stability? Uh, I'm waiting. But if they implemented the strategies that caused the chaos, why aren't they implementing the strategies to stop the chaos? If under the prior administration the border was controlled, why aren't they going back to implement those strategies? Why aren't they getting the Mexican government to hold the people on their side like they did in the prior administration? Seems pretty logical. Five, will the solutions implemented resemble anything like our Constitution? Within this pondering, some sunlight may shine as to what is going on in our country across the board. So today and forward, it is very important to keep in mind that founding principles of our country and to give thanks. From there and in our hearts, the seeds of wisdom will hopefully one day bloom again for mankind. You can only pray. I pray hard about this. Remember, rights are God-given. Rights can't be taken away. Yet they're trying. It's only because I'm very cautious and I speak about facts that I'm still here. And there's a lot of facts I don't even talk about because fact checkers will still dump me. Again, if I'm not here, go to canammissing.com, Canadian American, canammissing.com, and I will have a link as to where I will be next. They can dump me off this channel, but they can't keep me off from making videos. I'll be on another channel one way or another. The reality of it is, whether they dump me off Twitter, YouTube, there's always someplace else to go. And I'll be there. And I'm gonna keep telling you facts. Not my truth, not my opinion, facts. And if you look for the people who have lived it, Border Patrol, Sheriffs that are in the jurisdiction. How about people that live near the, the border? And interview those people, which I've watched, and they tell you how horrendous it is. Drugs by the pounds are getting f taken through their property. The property is being vandalized. Their kids are threatened by the people coming through their yards. How about the terrorists that have been caught at the border? But what about the hundreds that aren't caught? And there are hundreds. Next letter. Dear Dave, I'm writing to you with two hunting stories from the Ute Reservation in Utah. I was raised in the 80s on the reservation. My father, a career Special Forces Army Ranger, needless to say since childhood, I was taught to be silent, stealthy, and aware. Perfect. Reminder, don't wear headphones, ear plugs, whatever, while you're walking in the woods. My father himself, a tribal ranger, would often patrol the southern extension and tell stories of light beings that would visit him. People often were afraid and respected my father who could patrol an area normally never visited too long. Some people thought he had special powers. To most natives living close to the land, the supernatural world is not apart from the day-to-day. -day. One is often more a part of us. We have seen Bigfoot, stick Indians, and their small horses, werewolves, several types of humanoid animal creatures, several types of aliens and aircrafts, fairly common in our sky. But the most eventful story took place in 2017 during a December bison hunt. Let me stop there for a second. Having spent a lot of time on reservations earlier in my life doing research with Harvey Pratt, a Native American chief, Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation Divisional Chief, there's a lot of things on reservations that go on there that don't go on other places. And we often ask ourselves why that is. And it's a good question. Maybe the people can be trusted it's kind of known that they don't want to talk about it to others because they don't want to be made fun of. Um, 
a lot of them think it's a gift and they don't want to compromise that gift. But I guarantee it happens more there than other places. So, my son, then 16, brother and nephew, accompanied me to the bison hunting grounds. It is always a good idea to hunt bison when the ground freezes and there's an open window in the weather. Leaving at 5 a.m. to hunt midday, our priority is always watch the sunlight. Due to previous near encounters, we no longer camp in the south. Everyone on the reservation is aware things are much more active than when I was a child, and the land itself sends the warning to leave by dusk. We lucked out on a young bull in the late afternoon. Nearly too late to take, but because it was easy to field dress and load, I took the shot. The low light of the sky felt ominous, and the heavy clouds were also making the weight of something amplified. My brother, who had a terminal illness, and I always shared a mind-eye connection, and we could often just know what each other were thinking. After 45 minutes of field dressing and loading the bison, the last of the sunlight opened the sky, and a warm breeze came up the valley from the south. Kind of odd. Hurry, my brother finally said. I agreed, and just as the last quarter was loaded in the clouds, loaded, comma, the clouds drew in, and a cold wind arose. Get in, I told the boys, as my brother and I had gotten in already. We didn't talk. Normally we stop at a spring to wash up and open a can of beans and eat our snacks, not this time. The fingers of the canyons rise and fall on the bottom and switchbacks lead north, then lead south in the adjacent canyon. This happens several times as you exit the area, leading finally to an aspen grove on the last edge leading north. Night had fallen during the drive out of the ridges. Despite the urgency to get out, I stopped to check the load and tires. Looking back to the west into the canyons we just left, I saw a strand of lights, orange and bright, looking like a string of pearls strewn up and down the ridges. Is that I-70, asked my brother. We both knew it was not, and it was far too, too much to the south, and it wasn't viable. There was no way traffic would be backed up like that on a ridge line like a strand that had been dropped. Hundreds of blazing orange lights lay, rid, lay on the ridge across the ridge, and that's when my anger rose. No way, they are looking for us. That was reminiscent of a fire line. So I pulled out my binoculars and saw the lights in the Aspen Forest. The orange lights were accompanied by beams of blue lights, like a flashlight strobing on the ground. The dark areas between the lights were so active, yet I did not see figures. The search information was three-tiered and directly scanned in a north direction as if the orange light, lights were searching. The first search tier searched the ground level and above, and that was a canopy beam, and then above the forest, just above, was a third set of blue searchlights. The slime formation was steadily moving north along the ridge and through, throughout formation, and despite down trees, and the ridge itself showed absolute systematic north sweeping movement. I was furious. They were looking for us. Should I shoot them? I asked my brother. I'm a trained marksman. It was my natural instinct. No, no, no. I felt something in the air move. Hurry, they think we are moving north. And when they realize we went south, they will switch back. And then we, we won't be able to leave. Still standing out of the truck where I had taken a lean to scope the area again, felt a shift in the air and the aspen leaves crackle. It was as if the forest said to get going, we can only hide you so long. I got in the truck, satisfied that the tires were good and the bison was riding well, and took to the north full bore and didn't look back. We all concurred that we felt and witnessed, although we are experienced in the spiritual world as a common event, this changed me. I would, also, I would often go to the southern unit, which is directly north of Moab. I wouldn't think twice of any type of hunting, camping, or fishing alone, despite being a woman. But since that moment, and the reality check that something of multitude was hunting us, I never again returned alone or after dark. I've become very cautious, asking permission to be in areas, feeling the silence and knowing to leave when it felt wrong. Once again, on another bison hunt, accompanied by my son, I fell sick and came out the next day with two black eyes. I did not return. I've seen cloaked, tall, insect-like creatures moving in the high uintas on a mountain goat hunt. Again, feeling rage at the gall of these creatures to silence miles of hunting areas with no animals could be found. These are very dangerous day days indeed. My brother led me to your channel and through your work he convinced me that I could no longer take part in the wilderness as I had 
a shadow in the woods and I could not go alone. I'm happy to continue to hunt for my family and minimize the risks thanks to your work. Be blessed, David. I pray you solace and peace in the season of winter and holiday. Thank you. Story. When I was writing The Hoopa Project and Tribal Bigfoot, two books, uh, I was given some information about a U.S. Force Service supervisor in Northern California, way out in the middle of nowhere. And I drove out to the area and through a couple of contacts, I found his house. Walked in, knocked on his door. Great guy, really good guy. He's since retired, but at the time he was still working. And I said, hey, uh, people told me that uh, you've had a lot of strange incidents in the woods, and I'm interested in hearing about them. I told him who I was, and he says, oh yeah. One of the stories he told me was he was working up in Northern California and he had a crew that was clearing brush on the side of a mountain. It was late dusk, so there were about 15 of them. I think there were 15, 10 to 15. And down in the canyon below, he said you, they saw just like a, your typical saucer slowly move up the canyon. And they said it was slow and it was below them. And he said, it got lower to the ground, and he said, These giant, this giant beam of light came from underneath it, like it was scanning the ground for something. He said, everybody stopped working, and we were just mesmerized and watched. Now, other people had heard this story from other members of his team, and he told it to me firsthand. It was in the books. And... When I hear a story like this, that this lady wrote, it reminds me of that incident. And you wonder how many times this has happened and it's not talked about. Or people don't know who to tell because they don't want to be made fun of. Yeah. Next story. Dave, first of all, please allow me to say I greatly respect your experience and insights into the phenomena of missing persons and would like to express my admiration and gratitude for your presentations in the name of voluntary public service to the community. Your advice to hikers and hikers alike, if heeded by most, would no doubt reduce the number of missing persons every year. Quite frankly, your professional approach and dedication is a godsend. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I used to hunt moose north of Lake Superior for a period of five years, unfortunately never experienced any odd or weird circumstances during those hunts. I know you often spoke about items of safety and survival that should be included in a hiker or hunter's kit. I was brainstorming new considerations to add to their arsenal of safety equipment. I try to look at it from this point of view of the person missing and those searching for them. So in addition to items you suggest that should be carried, I would like to propose a few other supplies. However, I will preface that I'm about to mention with the caveat that these things may not achieve anything for reasons I'll mention. My suggestions may, will be mainly for hardcore lone hunters and hikers who are either in remote areas or will, know, or will knowingly be in the wild for extended periods of time. I would like to bounce these things off you and see what you think, assuming someone is lost or immobile. First, how about including two or three road flares to the kit? A lit road flare would be easy to see, especially in the dark or against a contrasting background like snow. Taking it a little further, why not pack a couple of high shooting Roman candle fireworks in the backpack? Maybe parks would be against this practice because it may pose the possibility of causing a forest fire. However, the flares could be wrapped in tin foil, then unfolded and burnt on the foil for reflection and to prevent a fire. The embers of a Roman candle are usually spent by the time they reach the ground. Certainly, fireworks in the middle of the bush would attract the attention of any searcher. At the first hint of any aerial vehicle, the victim would easily light the flare or firework to signal them. The other suggestion would be carrying one of those old, correct that, one of those loud aerosol boating horns to audibly signal a searcher. The added safety options with material would provide and would easily outstrip the liability of their extra weight. So, my thoughts. Uh, the road flares, uh, hard to control. I've used, I used them for 20 years in police work. Hard to control, they burn very hot. 
yeah, you could start a forest fire. Um, on boats, you can buy flares and a little gun that you shoot the flare into the sky. Uh, that's pretty light, and you usually get two for a gun. I'd see those would be good. I don't want to advocate the flare just because of forest fires, but your ideas, they're good. They're significant. I just wouldn't use them. Contrarily, I suspect that given the nature of disappearances like Tom Messick, Messick was a hunter that was in Missing 4 and won The Hunted, which you can watch for free on YouTube movies, and others who vanished without a trace, whatever the culprit is, it springs upon the victim with such frightful suddenness that they have no time to react with any life-saving device of any kind, including firearms. That's downright scary. I don't like to jump to conclusions, but in this mysterious but evident realm, I think we need to think outside the box and admit that despite the scientific method, there may be forces, entities, invisible predators, or other dimensional beings which we do not know the nature of and will therefore continue to confound us in an endless nightmarish enigma. Whenever I hear of these disappearing cases which grossly defy all logic or common sense, and the victims are never found, the case solved, I now say they were snatched. It's like the first 48 hours. If you can't find them within that time period, any additional searching will probably be futile. We need to look the doubting Thomases straight in the eye and say, something took them. They're not here anymore. They're gone somewhere that we can't access. After all, there was the Travis Walton for five days, and he certainly didn't return on, her, on his own terms. I don't mean searches should be called off, but the likelihood of finding them, which I assume you will agree, often turns out to be nil. Thanks for hearing me out, Dave. I appreciate it. So remember, the gross, large, huge percentage of most searches don't involve cases that I research. The vast, vast majority, people are found, people are okay, and there's nothing super weird about them. It's only in a small percentage that I research that there is something odd going on. So I would say stay the course, but carry those items I talk about in a video I made earlier this year about hiking the trail and safety items to carry in your, in your backpack. If you look at our videos, you will find it. New email. Hi, Dave. After listening to your conversation with James Fay and the account of the owner of Bluff Creek Resort being killed by a falling tree in a windstorm, it triggered a memory of a somewhat similar incident my father-in-law and I witnessed back in August of 84 at a, boat, at a spot we both fished and hunted. In this case, we had pulled up to our usual parking spot <clears throat> at an old corral on the bench above the river canyon, and we were about to get out and hike down on the river and fish when a sudden, violent, unexpected windstorm hit. We decided to hold up for a minute and stay in the truck to see if the wind would calm down, and right then a bachelor mule deer herd compromising of seven good bucks came running into a stand of big dead cottonwoods right beside us, 35 yards away. They were spooked, probably by the wind, we thought. They were trotting, trotting around confused, milling about in a fairly tight circle when the large dead cottonwoods around them started to blow over, coming close to crushing some of the bucks. It was about eight trees in all over the course of about a minute, at the end of which the deer got organized and bolted off uphill and were gone. My father-in-law and I sat there stunned. The trees around the deer were the only ones blowing down and only one tree at a time. None of the falling trees struck other trees to knock them down and they were falling in all different directions, just not downwind. But one thing for sure, they all fell towards the bucks. To this day, I'm confused as to what actually occurred by that corral that morning, but it sure looks suspicious. Those trees looked almost manually forced over and even directed. <clears throat> Each tree was broken off right at the ground level, not part way up. But nothing was seen other than the deer and the falling trees. Okay, nobody got hurt, including us, but none of the trees actually came down in our direction. As a side note, we have had several encounters with Sasquatch in this immediate area. Makes you wonder if there's a connection. 
Greatly appreciate your, dedic appreciate your dedication to the missing, David. Please keep doing what you're doing, and to hell with the trolls. Thank you. I appreciate that. Send me an email about your uh, Sasquatch encounters. I'm interested. Especially the area that this happened in, I'm interested. Thank you. Well, I'm telling you folks, <laughs> the letters I get, you only get a small percentage of them, but the letters I get are some of the best I've ever had. And uh, the back and forth communications I have with some of these people are phenomenal. And I, I appreciate the contributions from each of you on these. So, you got three stories from you, for you. Three different states, baffling, all different in their own way. So the first case involves a young boy, 22 months old. For the parents out there, I want you to think about how mobile your 22 month old was. And I know some people are gonna say, oh yeah, my 22 month old could walk six miles. Oh, my 22 year old could run as fast as a seven year old. I hear this. Okay, well that's not normal. But, so Charles went missing June 26, 1952 in Asheville, North Carolina at about 4.30 in the afternoon. People who don't know, Asheville is about 40 miles away from Great Smoky Mountain National Park and a strand of mountains where I've documented many missing kids over the years. Can't explain it, it's weird. Well, he was playing in the yard of his parents' home in a very well-to-do area of Asheville. His dad was a physician. He was out in the backyard and he was with his dog, a collie named Skippy. Skippy didn't like people. And when people came close to Charles, the dog would bark and get mad. Well, mom came outside, Charles wasn't around. Looked, yelled, called for neighbors for help, called the husband. He came home from his practice and very soon they had hundreds of searchers all over their area looking. Important point here. This area was very rural. This is Charles Cherry. Let's get you a good look at him. Very rural, very thick with foliage, and looked much different than it does today back in 1952. The father said, when he spoke to searchers, said, if anybody came near my son, that dog would have barked. If anybody, anything came near my son, would have barked. And my son wouldn't have left the yard. Keep that in mind. So, you got hundreds of policemen. They called in police trackers. And they called in several canine units. So, that first 12 hours, the trackers said they couldn't find any evidence of any footprints leaving the yard troubling, and the canines weren't picking up a scent of the boy leaving the yard. Remember that. And it said it in the article, the canines could not pick up a scent. So they searched all through the night. They brought in some floodlights, and they brought in some of those big movie lights they had in the old days that would shoot up into the sky, hoping that Charles would walk towards them. But he didn't. But the next day, about 22 hours after he disappears, about 1.15 p.m., searchers are on a road called Chun's Cove, C-H-U-N-N-S. And in front of searchers, Charles comes walking out of the forest right in front of him. Now, when he left, he only had on a diaper, no shoes, no shirt, nothing else. This was June 26, so it was warm. The first thing and the only thing he said was water and doggy. That's it. Well, he's taken home right away. And the father, who's a physician, examined his son. And in the paper, he said, my son's feet do not match being in the wild for 22 hours. Bingo. Something I have always said that I'm interested in the feet and I'm interested in the contents of the stomach. Has that person eaten? If they haven't eaten, what do their feet look like? Well, the people said that the boy had some scratches on his body 
and you had some dirt, but not what you would expect for 22 hours. Searchers went back into where he came out, and that immediate area, they found some grass that was pushed down, and they found his footprints. They didn't find footprints coming into that area or footprints leaving that area other than his on that time. And as Charles came out, his dog come, came running out right behind him. Now the dog wouldn't get near the patrol car or the policeman, and they tried to get him into the car, he wouldn't. So it kind of proved the father's point that it wasn't a friendly dog to other people. But when Charles got back, got into the police car, Skippy went up the hill, or I'm sorry, down the hill, full speed toward the residence. Key point here. Charles was found far up a hill from where he lived. 22 months old. He walked uphill all that way? Hmm. Don't know. Very suspicious to me. So the policeman wanted to know, how did he get out of his yard? How did he get into the area where he was found? They thought it quite coincidental that he walked out right in front of other searchers on a street. Very strange. I'll show you the area here. So the residence was in this location in, South, in uh, Asheville. It was a half mile distance uphill from where he disappeared to where he was found. Uphill. Very thick woods, lots of bushes, a lot of area to get scratched in. This is Asheville right here. Smoky Mountains right here. Suspicious? I'd say so. Uh, when I researched this case, I was very concerned about it for a multitude of reasons that I just explained to you. But the part that really got me was that the dad did exactly what I would have done, examine my son's feet. Yeah. Now, in Missing 411 Eastern U.S., I wrote a series of dozens of cases from Pennsylvania where young kids, like Charles, disappeared from their yard with a dog, just like Charles did. And sometimes the boy or girl was found, and sometimes the dog was not found. So in this incident, it seemed like the dog was with the boy that entire time. The other point the searchers made is that there were hundreds of people in that half mile radius all the time while Charles was gone. Why didn't the dog ever bark? They were combing the area. Why didn't Charles say something? Because the people were all calling his name. But even if Charles was afraid, the dog should have barked. Never did. Very suspicious. So that's Charles Cherry, 22 months old, June 26, 1952, Asheville, North Carolina. Or Asheville, South Carolina. So, North Carolina, I'm sorry. Now, next case. I've talked to you before about young men, super healthy, athletic types that disappear. This is one of those cases. Uh, the young man's name was Larry Amazich, German, 24 years old. He went missing July 9th, 1959, almost seven years and a month after Charles disappeared, 50 miles south of Juneau, Alaska. Now, Larry was from a town called Rock Springs, Wyoming. <laughs> When I heard that, I nearly fell off my chair because a lot of my research in the last two years has found missing people around Rock Springs, Wyoming. And I've talked to you before about the association where people were born or raised and their disappearance. Specifically, I talked to you about two 
medical professionals, physical therapists in Alaska that live very close to each other, both disappeared under suspicious circumstances. And my research found that they were raised within 40 miles of each other near the Great Lakes. Who would have thought? Was, well, that's weird. So Larry was raised in Rock Springs. And in high school, he was a standout defensive player. Well, he was picked up by the University of Utah on a scholarship to play football in 56 and 57, and in fact, was co-captain in 57, and then was an assistant coach for the freshman from 58 to 59. Well, in the summer of 59, he went to work for a company out of Salt Lake City named Boyle's uh, Brothers Mining Company and Drilling. Well, they had a site south of Juneau in the middle of nowhere. They had a drill site. Well, on July 9th, Larry had the afternoon off and he decided that he was going to hike four miles down to the beach. So this, this is what Larry looked like. Tough kid, big kid. And he had been in Alaska a lot and knew the dangers well, he took off four mile hike to the beach, following a creek down to the beach. Hard to disappear, but he disappeared. And Boyle's brothers drilling went all out and all in trying to find him. They hired a helicopter. The helicopter pilot knew a sheriff in Lane County, Oregon, that would be willing to fly up with his canines to search for Larry. And the sheriff came up. The Hilo pilot flew him into the site and they spent four days trying to search. So this is, a, this is Juno up here. This is Sum Dumb Island and right adjacent to that is where the drill camp was and where he disappeared. Let's say there's a lot of water in this area. So the canine searched and they found tracks leaving the drill site going towards the beach. And then they lost it in every brush. Well, during the search, it rained and they couldn't, couldn't find any more scent. But they searched that four mile strip back and forth multiple, multiple times. Didn't find anything. Never found Larry. Very suspicious. And when I read the case, it bothered me because he was such a young, athletic man, intelligent, university educated, German descent, and from Rock Springs, Wyoming. <laughs> Again, I can't make this stuff up. Weird. And then you think Rock Springs, that's kind of in the middle of a, a des desert type environment of Wyoming. What would be happening there? How could somebody disappear? Yeah, all good points. But it's happening. Okay, the next case involves a man who lived his entire life at one residence, 85 years old, Ernest McClamant. Disappeared April 6th, 1981, six miles northeast of Hunter, Kansas. Now, if anybody has our cluster map, there is nobody missing from this area for a 150 mile radius. All of that central area going north to south of the US, I have almost no cases. But this case is a dead ringer. So McClamant owned a ranch and he was born and raised on the property that he worked. He was a single man. He had 306 acres and he had 25 acres that he was growing wheat and the rest was given to his cattle. On July 6th, just like clockwork, one day a week, he'd drive into the city, he'd make a deposit of his checks, he would get a small amount of money to live the, for the rest of the week, he'd go to the post office and then he would go to the farming co-op to make some purchases. And people said 
they all knew he was in perfect health. He was in a great mood. And they saw nothing abnormal. The people at the bank who were interviewed by the sheriff said there was nobody unusual in or around the city that day or in or around the bank. Uh, everything about Ernest seemed completely normal. Nothing weird. Well, what happened was is that he left town after that and went to go see a friend to order some hay for his cattle. He then left his friend's house. That was the last time he was seen. Well, that friend delivered the hay three days later and found a lot of mail for three days that hadn't been picked up in the mailbox and his cattle roaming free with no feed and no truck of Ernest around. So he called the sheriff. Sheriff came out and they started to search a four mile radius from the ranch. And what they found is they found his truck found about a uh, truck about a mile and a quarter away parked on the top of a bluff. And it was near a gate into a, another field. And they thought maybe he was stopping there to get some loose cattle. So that's where they started the search. Sheriff brought in canines. Let me show you a picture of Ernest. It's Ernest. So they went back to his property. One of the stops he made that day was at groceries and he bought some eggs and some milk. And they found the bag empty with eggs and milk in the refrigerator. Everything seemed normal, except <coughs> his truck parked in an area called Blue Hills. So they put the canines on it and the canines go and they find tracks around a pond not too far from the truck. So the sheriff orders the pond drained. Nothing's in it. Well, then they see tracks going away from the pond into the middle of a wheat field. Canines track and they lose the track and the canines stop searching. Then they flew multiple planes over the wheat field and don't see anything. So there's a lot of water in this area. They brought in canines. They thought he was out looking for cows. They interviewed witnesses in the area and the sheriff told the press that people in the community thought that Ernest was abducted by aliens. That was the comment in the news. Now, right here is Hunter, Kansas. This is the area where the residence was and in this same general area is where he disappeared. Ernest's residence and part of his property bordered a creek in that area. A lot of water. Now, <clears throat> in 1983, two years after he disappeared, they found a skull and they never said where. And they thought, well, it must be Ernest. But they could never positively identify in 83 if it was Ernest or not. And they found the skull in a ditch on the side of the road, which is weird. But they, they never could identify the skull. So what happened to Ernest McClamont? Now, I've told you before that I've had people that have disappeared from cars in areas that to me appeared they were going to get a view of the area. Why would they be getting a view unless they saw something? What did they see that caused them to drive up to the top of a knoll and abandon his truck? Initially, some people thought he had some stray cattle that got loose, but that was proven not to be true. They could never understand why Ernest went to that spot. There were some other people that's, that's brought up the idea that maybe he took his own life. The community said there was no way. He had a lot to live for. He was in excellent health. He had good property. He was growing good crops. They said no. But I'm sorry, folks. When they cut that field the, the, at the end of the season and they didn't find his body in the wheat field, where could he go? This is Kansas. This is the Rocky Mountains. So, 
Ernest McClamant, 85 years old. How far could you walk? Missing April 6, 1981 from Hunter, Kansas. Larry Amazich, an athlete, strong young man, 24 years old, disappeared July 9, 1959, 50 miles south of Juneau, Alaska. And then Charles Cherry, 22 months old from Asheville. What happened there? So I hope you can see the, the points I'm making in each of these videos, and I hope it's resonating in you that these are unusual. There aren't easy answers, and families were devastated by the disappearances. In 1988, Ernest was declared legally deceased, so he's not long, they're even missing. And his sister did that so she could take care of the property, sell it, and move it on. And the sister lived in Oregon. But anyhow, I appreciate you being here. Please give me a thumbs up if you like the video. Please understand I'm only feeding you facts. I'm not giving you an opinion about what I think. I do appreciate your opinion. Again, as I've said in the past, if you have a story about you being in the woods or in the middle of nowhere and something unusual happened, I want to hear it. Please write to me. That's Can-Am, like Canadian American, can -Am missing at yahoo.com. You can follow me on Twitter, David Politis at can -Am missing. And our store still has everything in stock. And the address for the store is listed right below the first comment on this video. But it's NA, like North America Bigfoot Search at yahoo.com. That's the email for the store. The store itself is any like North America BigfootSearch.com. Just go to the store. That's our sister site. So thank you again. Have a safe holiday season, and we'll see you soon. Pull this out.